Good morning, class. This is our final lecture before the midterm. So I'll be covering the texts that were assigned. Um, I asked you to read Nimsy Wood the Borogoves and the uh, associated critical article by Darko Suvin called Estrangement and Cognition. As well, I will talk about Flowers for Algernon. You are uh, expected to just be comfortable with uh, the narrative's um, uh, impact on you cognitively. So this whole lecture is about estrangement and cognition, a concept coined by Darko Suvin, and one which I find to be quite compelling in our analysis of science fiction as a genre. So uh, we'll begin with uh, Suvin, and um, I'd like you to follow the lecture slides uh, on the screen, um, but also to take notes on what you think is most uh, relevant to your understanding of the readings. So the premise um, in Mimsy Where the Bora Goes, a story uh, first published in 1943, a significant uh, date um, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, the uh, historical um, uh, context uh, of World War II and the kind of unrest and political uh, uh, instability that uh, underpins this story is interesting to reflect upon. The story uh, begins with something quite uh, estranging right away. Uh, I think it's easy enough to uh, surmise. Uh, the first sentence claims that there's no use trying to describe either Untha Horsten or his surroundings, because for one thing, a good many million years had passed since 1942 Anno Domini, and for another, Untha Horsten wasn't on Earth, technically speaking. So we're not here and not now, um, as that would, um, would say. And, um, the uh, story's premise uh, immediately launches us into this idea of time travel. The scientist, Unter Horsten, um, uh, creates a time machine and puts his son's toys, which are uh, described as conditioning tools, uh, you'll notice. Um, his son, we are told, has already learned from them so that he has no need for them any longer. And so uh, the scientist sends these toys uh, into the past, not quite sure exactly where they will land. Um, and uh, having uh, received no obvious feedback that his experiment was successful, he gives up. But uh, as the narrator tells us, uh, the um, damage has been done, meaning the toys arrive somewhere and cause some mayhem. So the toys in the story symbolize a kind of estrangement. They are the source of novum, as Darko Suman would say. And um, this estrangement is created uh, most prominently for the kids who learn from the toys. They begin to perceive the world around them differently because of their uh, playing uh, time with these gadgets from the distant future. So one of the questions to ask uh, for this, uh, for the theme in this lecture is how do you know when you are entering a different perception, when you perceive not through the eye, the ideal eye of the self, uh, maybe we can say, the kind of eye that you see yourself in your head, um, but you start to look at something quite differently. What sparks the detachment from the way you usually perceive things? So Suvin's big idea um, is that the separation of cognitive thinking um, so cognitive thinking for him uh, uh, would signify a uh, kind of reality uh, perception uh, where you do not uh, attempt to estrange um, from that cognition. And uh, then the uh, separation between that reality principle uh, or uh, 
of reality kind of uh, lens um, and the movement towards possibilities, right? What if factor, as James Gunn would say. So Scotty and Emma are introduced to these new objects from the future and uh, it offers them a different look, a new kind of world. Um, and um, uh, as we think about what Suvin says in his uh, article, Estrangement and Cognition, um, he highlights the importance of science fiction in a time, he says our time, so in, in the 21st century, um, because of the close relationship to new objects and new gadgets, right? We have these smartphones that we carry mostly um, everywhere, uh, unless you are a serious Luddite, right? And uh, do not um, have a smartphone or never really look at it. So uh, an object like that um, becomes part of our perception of the world. I mean, we point our cameras at a lot of things and take snaps and, you know, uh, snapshots and then we put them on Snapchat, apparently. I don't know, I never used it, but uh, these kinds of, you know, activities that would have been so strange and even um, would may have appeared as crazy behaviors to earlier generations. Imagine if you could travel back in time and demonstrate what your smartphone is capable of just 100 years ago. Um, so our close kinship um, with uh, uh, this kind of technological um, a milieu, uh, uh, surroundings, background um, that we now experience has something to do with the rise of science fiction's importance, uh, one could argue. But um, Suvin also adds that, quote, science fiction has close kingship with other literary subgenres. Um, which flourished at different times and places of literary history. And so um, it has absorbed into it different tropes from, uh, you know, medieval fortune island stories or some voyage stories, uh, utopias and planetary, planetary novels where you have, you know, men traveling to the moon and discovering something interesting there. Um, and this um, can be linked very much to the Enlightenment period and the rise of modern science, essentially, right? So um, what is different for Suvin about science fiction? Um, he says it shares with myth and fantasy and fairy tale and even the pastoral an opposition to naturalistic or empiricist literary genres. Um, yet, uh, for him, it differs significantly in its approach to uh, structuring perception for the reader, I would add, and the social function. So uh, Suvin very much believes um, in a uh, kind of generative force of science fiction uh, to, to generate some kind of social change is what he thinks science fiction should technically strive towards. So the concept of estrangement itself, um, uh, for those who study literature, comes uh, from the uh, school of thought called formalism, or uh, Russian formalists were, um, uh, in the early 20th century, a movement of literary uh, kind that um, challenged the way the state wanted everything to be perceived through uh, a kind of realist lens, you know, the working man, the perception of a regular kind of, you know, citizen of this planet. Um, what does it mean to be a good worker and a good citizen of the state? Russian formalists were um, skeptical of this kind of discourse and um, they uh, presented a whole school of thought about reading literature on its own terms, reading it more like poetry, looking at its structures, looking at the way the text actually works. And so they came up with this notion that literature in itself is different from real speech um, because it causes estrangement.
you take a step away from your regular perception if you are reading literature. So in Russian, astranenia uh, is a, a kind of stepping away from the self to some degree, whatever that degree, um, it depends on the text. So if you're in fantasy, you know, for example, you could be radically um, uh, distant from a regular perception or more subtle versions like the one I think we have in Mimsy where the horror goes. So strange and unfamiliar um, ways of looking um, is what estrangement means. Um, another related uh, word would be defamiliarization, to defamiliarize from something or other. So if you look at this probably very um, uh, common example, this uh, image on the screen, uh, if you look carefully, you may see more than one image, right? You might first see a young woman um, with a feather on her head and uh, you know her chiseled chin right there and her uh, hair is covered up by some kind of um, shawl or scarf and then if you look at it differently you may see that the chiseled chin is actually a nose and there's this uh, frowning mouth and a long chin and that this is a an old woman Here's one of her tired looking eyes. <laughs> so um, seeing things from a different angle or seeing things in more than one way is what we're kind of after here. And uh, you could look at this link on your own, um, the tricks of perception, how do we see reality or how do we challenge the way we see reality essentially. So um, I wanted to uh, just recap, we were, in the very first lecture on James Gunn's text, discussing a kind of spectrum where science fiction falls somewhere between reality and fantasy, that it's not as um, detached from reality as fantasy, but it is, you know, a way it is detached from realism. Um, for Suvin, uh, there's another way to see this. The spectrum he proposes ranges from ideal realism. So this is realism that is uh, presented in a, uh, a way that is, uh, you can say, ideologically constructed. It's the way that a certain um, society wants you to perceive the world. And then Novum is his concept of the newness, the strangeness that could be introduced into the environment. So um, I would argue that in science fiction, um, trying to map the details of what constitutes the novum, the new strange environment or element, um, can lead us to an understanding of the imaginative change or uh, the kind of new perception um, uh, that leads us to appreciate the ideal realism against which the novum is pushing. Um, so, if you are asked to perceive, for example, to go back to uh, last week, uh, to Octavia Butler um, and her representation of gender roles, um, the novum, you know, is clear enough. You have these aliens who impregnate men, right? This is the novum element in the story. What she's pushing against is the ideal realism of a female body as being this... Um, uh, a political kind of uh, vessel for babies that, you know, there is no political construct around the way women should have children. Um, I hope that makes sense. So um, then what the author in science fiction does, according to Suvin, is introduce the novum to struggle against uh, the ideal realism um, that the author is trying to transcend. So transcending what we know, to go back to uh, the episode uh, Measure of a Man, if you recall, um, data is put on trial uh, uh, simply um, 
due to the fact that a scientist is interested in taking him apart and studying him, so dissecting him like a lab rat, um, to see if he can recreate uh, what uh, Dr. Uh, Soon, Dr. Noonien Soon uh, created. Um, so uh, data refuses to be subject to this test because he is a sentient being. That's one of the um, characteristics uh, that Picard uses to prove that he deserves to be treated as a person. Um, and there's an interesting element of uh, social commentary about the fact that if we were able to create disposable uh, sentient beings, that this would be equivalent to slavery. Um, uh, that if we were, uh, I should add, if we were able to create them and treat them any way we want and um, suggest that they are less than uh, we are the creators, then this would be um, the kind of power relationship that is reminiscent of slavery. So um, that is, you know, the Star Trek example of questioning uh, ideas of, uh, ideas that range from what it means to be an intelligent, a sentient um, being and uh, towards the more mystical or religious questions of, you know, do, do we have a soul? Does a sentient being uh, created in such a sophisticated way as Data or Helen O'Loy, do these um, uh, persons have a soul, you know? And does it matter uh, uh, whether we do or not when it comes to legal rights and the right to choose one's own fate and to be a free subject, etc. So, of course, um, we will look at very, very um, interesting explorations of creation uh, and evolution debates in our novel, which I'm asking you to start reading over the reading break. Uh, so Robert Sawyer's Calculating God. So we'll get into that um, eventually. Just a reminder that you must start reading um, in order to enjoy the future lectures after the reading break. So I wanted to... Uh, go through some of other uh, important details in Suvin's uh, article. He talks about the mirror, which links us back to the mirror stage uh, reading. He says that essentially these elements of novum, uh, like the aliens, monsters, or whatever it is, um, or, you know, androids and, and so on, are a kind of a mirror to us. And, sexist language, a mirror to man, just as the differing country is a mirror for his world. So he writes, the mirror is not just a reflecting one, it is also a transforming one, a virgin womb and alchemical dynamo. The mirror is a crucible. So um, I will not ask you to define these terms on the midterm. Um, so uh, what I want you to start um, doing in this course is collecting interesting language that you could out of your own volition use uh, in order to explain some of the more complex um, thoughts you're having about the text that we're reading. So you will not uh, have to uh, define anything um, on the midterm, but rather engage with the ideas that the texts are um, asking you to consider. So for example, if um, an alien works like a mirror, how do we perceive ourselves through that mirror, right? Suvin says, well, it's a transformation. It's not just a mirror where you see your reflection, but rather it's a mirror where you appreciate the difference between your self and the other that is being depicted in the story. Um, how this is a virgin womb is an interesting question to ask. I look forward to having our next live class and where we will uh, discuss this a little bit more in depth. Um, and um, the idea of immaculate uh, conception or, or kind of, you know, a birth without earthly um, conditions uh, and the kind of sacred aspect that some uh, ascribe to uh, certain stories and mythologies in our um, culture. Um, this is all um, 
the kind of ideal realism, I suppose, that Suvin is playing with. Um, and um, the transformations, so the alchemical dynamo, right? In, in alchemy, the idea of, for example, taking any kind of um, regular material and turning it into gold, a magic kind of transformation of that sort, is something that he's um, alluding to. Uh, a crucible, a place where something goes through a transformation, like a phoenix, you know, burning up and then uh, turning into something new, a, a rebirth, right? So he's playing with all these very interesting images. And um, uh, the severe test of the crucible, which is the metaphorical uh, usage of that word, um, is for the reader to come through this test, this, you know, alchemical transformation, and to arrive at a new perception of the world, essentially. So strangeness, according to Charles Baudelaire, um, is the necessary ingredient in beauty. And this is a beautiful, I think, thought to keep in mind, that um, strangeness is something that we do actually uh, desire or uh, strive towards um, in our perception. We notice things that are, if not unique, then uh, not ordinary at the very least. Um, but at the same time, uh, what you see as strange is based on your uh, perception and how it is structured, right? So um, Suvin says, for example, science fiction has always been wedded to a hope of finding in the unknown, the ideal environment, tribe, state, intelligence, or other aspect of the supreme good. So this is the utopian side of science fiction, um, where, you know, you strive to imagine a perfect society where there would be perfect equality, for example. Um, if you want a good story about the, um, way this could turn into a nightmare pretty quickly, you could read uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron, which was on the reading list, but due to lack of time, I decided to exclude it this time around. But uh, Harrison Bergeron, Kurt Vonnegut, is a great, uh, very short, sweet story about um, everyone being equal and how this is achieved through um, uh, a totalitarian state uh, you know, use, that uses handicaps to make everybody literally um, as pathetic as uh, the most common denominator you can imagine. So um, the aspect of imagining something better or something worse is always um, tempting in the landscape of science fiction. And um, in our story for today, Mimsy Were the Borogoves, um, we have uh, a playful uh, critique of scientific discourses that uh, tell us that we know how to perceive the world from a very objective scientific kind of perspective, right? So um, uh, you can read, by the way, the link provided here is um, uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, Jabberwocky. And um, I do have a sample of it here. Um, so um, the reason behind the story's title, if uh, you haven't looked it up yet, is that in um, Alice in Wonderland, um, Humpty Dumpty uh, speaks to Alice and um, she doesn't understand the poem Jabberwocky. So she asks Humpty Dumpty to explain some of these uh, weird terms that she's unfamiliar with. So it's uh, an example of playful poetic defamiliarization from uh, the le regular language we're familiar with. So the poem uh, that the story alludes to um, uh, is, uh, it begins with twas brillig and the slithy toes. Um, and, you know, that sounds like jabberwocky. It sounds like gibberish, right? So Alice, Alice in Wonderland asks, um, you seem very clever at explaining words, sir. 
uh, would you kindly tell me the meaning of the poem Jabberwocky? So Humpty Dumpty says, well, uh, for example, twas brillig means it was four o'clock in the afternoon, the time when you begin broiling things for dinner. And the slithy toves means both lithe and slimy. Um, lithe is the same as active. You see, it's like a portmanteau, a, a suitcase. Uh, so two things brought together into one word and so on. So just a quick, uh, explanation of why the story is called what it is and of course at the end of the uh, story it is this poem that the kids recite in order to travel to the distant future so they figure out time travel on their own through their interaction with the toys so when um, the parents of uh, Scotty and Emma discover that their kids are starting to think in very strange ways um, they freak out, you know, and they call a psychologist because that's what I suppose a good um, parent, uh, deeply embedded in ideal realism would do. Uh, they would call a specialist um, to check out uh, the abnormalities of their uh, child or children. So Dr. Holloway, who shows up, looks at the kids, observes the way they're playing with the toys and says, well, you know, I mean, they're behaving in a way that is uh, congruent with um, what he understands to be uh, the difference between children and adults. So there's a binary that the story tries to uh, disturb uh, and also uh, question, right? So he says, quote, babies, of course, are not human. They are animals and have a very ancient and ramified culture as cats have and fishes and even snakes. In short, babies have minds which work in terms and categories of their own, which cannot be translated into the terms and categories of the human mind. So children are not human is the premise um, here that uh, helps the psychologist to explain why the children are behaving differently as a result of their playtime with the toys from the future. So he also adds that the mind is uh, like a tool that gets conditioned as the animal matures. So here we also have human animal binary being set up. And um, so uh, the mother of the children actually clues into what the psychologist says and uh, says, okay, I guess I understand that as we age, our thought arteries, right? So it's a metaphor, thought arteries, the arteries through which thoughts run, they become hardened. They are hardening as we age because they become less flexible in their ability to stray away from the way you were taught to think. So then Darko Subin's connection to uh, uh, Galileo Galilei here, I think, is uh, quite fantastic. Um, before humans, as we recall in First Contact, um, uh, the Star Trek episode I asked you to watch, um, before the kind of moment that we witnessed in First Contact, where humans are given a sense of their uh, small place in the universe among the rest of the possible uh, sentient beings, other possible voices in the universe. Um, before that, uh, you know, a civilization may believe itself to be the only sentient, the only special creation in the entire universe. And this sounds very familiar. Um, in uh, the kind of perception that um, got Galileo Galilei in trouble was this um, religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, a kind of biblical um, doctrine of earth being at the center of the universe. When um, uh, both Copernicus and, and Galileo, um, you know, these figures of a, a break with the uh, older tradition of science, we can say, um, when they looked at the stars above and contemplated the movements of the stars, they 
practiced what we would call defamiliar de defamiliarization. Um, they kind of tilted their head and thought about the possibility of Earth not being at the center of the universe, but only being part of the celestial system that um, uh, doesn't place uh, us uh, at the very center of all creation in the universe. Okay, so this is uh, Suvin's example of what we kind of should strive for in our uh, reading of science fiction and that certainly that science fiction texts are uh, ones that encourage or advocate or stimulate this kind of Galilean observation. What if, you know, we can perceive things from a different um, vantage point. So um, science fiction as a type of cognition then, for Suvin uh, has a lot of pragmatical um, application. It's, it's, there's some pragmatism to his theory. Um, he claims that science fiction sees the norms of any age, including emphatically its own, as unique, changeable, and therefore subject to a cognitive view. Um, where he says the myth claims to explain once and for all, all these essence of phenomena. So he's juxtaposing science fiction to mythology. And he says mythology wants to uh, explain away the things we may not yet fully understand, put it all into an explainable kind of consumable package. Science fiction actually posits problems further in our cognition and tries to explore where these problems lead us so that um, uh, the kind of, I mean, you know, it's questionable how static myth myths are, but for Suvin, mythology is much more static and science fiction is much more dynamic. So um, he gives us an, exa an example. He says, science fiction does not ask about the man or the world, but actually pushes us to say, well, which man or woman or creature and in what kind of world are we, you know, looking at or talking about? So then science fiction is, again, different from fantasies or fairy tales and the wish fulfilling elements in uh, fairy tales or fantasies um, are uh, what, science fiction or the wish fulfillment element is what science fiction wants to uh, run through a uh, scientific explanation. If there is any form of, uh, you know, uh, variation from what we know as reality, for example, gravity, you know, in, in fairy tales, we have magic carpets and we don't ask how can the magic carpet fly? If you have a science fiction story, you are supposed to ask these kinds of questions. How do things work in this particular story? So in this sense, when you have a text like Mimsy Where the Bora Goes, uh, there isn't much of an explanation of how it is possible for the toys, each of them individually to influence the uh, human child's mind the way it does. In this sense, you can say that stories that do not try to explain very much about the scientific underpinnings of the story's premise uh, or the effects of novum, uh, these would be called soft science fiction. A text which tries to explain everything thoroughly and to do the calculations um, for the reader of how it is possible for a little dispatch ship to travel so far and so on. This is an attempt at hard science fiction, or at least this is what some critics have agreed to um, add to our definition of science fiction. So hard science fiction uh, tries to be very scientific and to not in, um, leave elements of the uh, unordinary or um, the estranging elements unexplained. And uh, soft science fiction is um, uh, more like the text where you just have a time traveling machine and there is no explanation for how this is possible. 
So we're not reading H.G. Wells as the time machine, but interestingly, despite the fact that today's science says time travel is not really possible, at the time when H.G. Wells was writing the story in 1899, um, uh, the possibility of time travel was not completely dismissed and the scientific explanation that uh, Wells um, writes into the story makes it uh, a kind of story that strives towards being, you know, a more scientifically underpinned kind of um, narrative. So I hope the difference between the two is uh, uh, more clear. Um, so the next um, section that I wanted to look at actually um, is where uh, Subin uh, adds another term to our understanding of his theory. So novum is the new estranging element in the science fiction story and he uh, contrasts this with our zero world. And zero world is his concept of uh, what is empirically verifiable. You know, if I take an object and I let it go, there was gravity that um, makes it fall. Um, in zero world, there's gravity. In novum world, there could be something that disturbs gravity and my phone will levitate um, without uh, uh, me doing anything to it. Um, the levitation aspect would be novum and it, if it were to be explained, um, then you would have a cognitively um, transformative experience of what it's like to live in a world where gravity is different, right? So um, in Mimsy Where the Borg Goes, how's the zero world depicted? As I said, this is World War II context and the novum, uh, the toys, are introduced to, uh, in part, comment on the way that uh, the children of the future may think very differently from the parents whose world resulted in two world wars, you can say. So um, uh, Scotty in particular at the very beginning of the story is skipping school and uh, he's not a big fan of geography as the text um, satirically points out because memorizing names of countries in 1943 uh, is a useless exercise because borders are being changed and um, politically we have a lot of unrest and so on and so forth, right? So um, I wanted us to quickly look at the toys that are um, presented in the story. So you have a doll which uh, the little girl uh, plays with and the doll has uh, a whole different um, uh, additional system it's a doll that uh, one of those, uh, you know, how, how to study anatomy kind of models where you can open up and look inside the doll at the organs. So we are um, told that the uh, doll has a whole new system that is not the circulatory, not the, not the um, uh, veins, uh, not the blood carrying system. It's not the nervous system. It's something else. Like there's an additional uh, organ system uh, that is uh, present in this doll, which points to the idea of uh, uh, evolution, essentially, of the human body in the future. You have the abacus. Um, so I want you to think about, I won't talk you through every single one, um, because I hope you read the story and you're thinking along with this lecture, but what does the abacus teach uh, Scotty? How does he make some of the beads disappear? right? The parents can't seem to figure out how to use the abacus. Um, what is it that they're lacking in their uh, perception, right? What other realms are they not perceiving that the children are starting to learn to perceive? What is the crystal box teaching Scotty, right? There is this um, mind to matter connection that he is starting to develop, which his parents lack. And um, of course, the children also, also start developing a new language. They start to speak to, uh, to each other in a language that the parents don't understand. So this is all, I think, quite fascinating um, to imagine that these toys can be used 
um, to create a whole new way of perceiving the world and that this perception leads to a detachment from that world to the point that the children eventually um, uh, invent a way to time travel. And of course, this is uh, a disaster for the parents, I'm sure. Um, uh, if you are a parent, it may be a kind of sad ending to the story. But um, the, I suppose, one possible interpretation of the story that um, I personally enjoy is that um, the future generations are meant to transcend their parents, their grandparents, to move forward somewhere uh, to new realms of perception, but also to new realms of existence. So I welcome you to think uh, for yourself further what each of the toys in the story uh, presents that is different from the zero world. Now, um, Last but not least, uh, Subin's text ends with a little bit of advice for how to think about the genre of science fiction. He claims that anything that is non-literature, that is not uh, fiction, should not be included in the genre. So uh, uh, non-fictional texts like scientific articles should not be uh, included in science fiction as a genre. The, uh, what he calls empiricist literary mainstream, uh, meaning novels that have no novum to be detected um, are definitely not science fiction and also non-cognitive estrangements such as fantasy. So for him, the cognition part of science fiction is really important that if you have elements that are radically novum-like, that there is a lot of strangeness, but it is for pure uh, enjoyment such as uh, a fairy tale where you just imagine all kinds of things and there is no cognitive aspect of thinking through the reasons for these uh, elements of novum, then this also does not qualify as science fiction. Um, and he also asks us to try to add as little confusion as possible to the definition. So if you're writing your first essay uh, on the topic of trying to define science fiction, please heed this advice. Um, so um, what I wanted to wrap up with uh, for this section of the lecture um, is um, uh, the notion that um, science fiction um, is a kind of cognitive genre, one that um, helps us to stir uh, a kind of, I, I guess, as Subin says, anticipation of, you know, either utopian elements or dystopian elements, um, possible meetings with others, with, you know, others of various kinds, with aliens, um, and that uh, for him, you know, the significant aspect of science fiction is very much a political, psychological, anthropological one. He is interested in how science fiction literature can affect, uh, can have an effect on knowledge and um, how it is a genre that stimulates um, a certain uh, social uh, change in an ideal um, uh, outcome of its uh, use. So I would like us to um, discuss this very much uh, further when we have our next um, session. And um, uh, on the midterm, all I ask you to do is to give your own understanding of what you think uh, Suvin has given us in addition to the previous uh, theoretical text that we read, which helped us to try to delineate what science fiction is or what it is not or how it uh, affects us. Um, and uh, please do uh, watch the lecture on Flowers for Algernon as well um, before you uh, write your midterm. Okay. And thank you so much.